What's up, guys? It's Mr. G. We are continuing our book. We are on Chapter 8. So, on Tuesday, they again did their laundry. The product of their efforts this time looked only slightly grayer than it did the time before. Claudia's sweater was considerably shrunken. They knew it was too early to get an answer to their letter, but they couldn't resist starting down to the Grand Central Post Office to take a look anyway. It was noon by the time they stopped and ate breakfast at the Chalk Full of Nuts on Madison Avenue. They dragged it out beyond the patience of the people who were standing waiting to occupy their seats. Both Claudia and Jamie almost didn't want to look at their box in the post office. As long as they didn't look, they still had hopes that they would find their letter there. They didn't. They strolled along the streets and found themselves near the United Nations building. Claudia suggested that to Jamie that they should take a guided tour. Today we can learn everything about the UN. Jamie's first question, how much? Claudia challenged them to walk in and find out. 50 cents each. They could go if Claudia was willing to skip dessert that afternoon. Jamie added, you know, you can't have your cake and take tours too. How about having tours and hot fudge sundaes too? Claudia asked. They stood in line and got tickets for a tour. The girl selling tickets smiled down at them. No school today? She asked casually. No, Jamie answered. The boiler on the furnace broke. No heat. They had to dismiss school. You should have heard the explosion. All the windows rattled. We thought it was an earthquake. Fourteen kids got cuts and abrasions, and their parents are suing the school to pay for their medical expenses. Well, it was about ten in the morning. We had just finished our spelling lesson when the man behind Jamie, who was dressed in a derby hat and who looked more as if he belonged in the UN than visiting, said, I say, what's the hold up to this line? I repeat, what is holding this line up? The girl gave Jamie the two tickets, and so, di and she did so. The man in the derby hat was already pushing his money into the counter. The girl looked after Jamie and Claudia as they were leaving and said, Where is? She couldn't finish her question. The man in the derby hat was scalding the girl. No wonder it takes the UN forever to get something done. I've never seen a line move more slowly. He only looked as if he belonged. He certainly didn't act like it. The girl blushed as she gave the man his ticket. I hope you enjoy your tour, sir. She acted, as if, she acted as if she belonged. Jamie and Claudia sat with the other ticket holders waiting for their numbers to be called. Claudia spoke softly to Jamie. You sure are a fast thinker. Where did you cook up that story about the furnace? I've had it ready and waiting ever since we left home. First chance I've had to use it, he answered. I thought I had thought of everything, Claudia said. That's okay. You're a you're quite a kid. Thanks, Jamie smiled. The guy who was calling the numbers finally said, Well, the people holding tickets numbers 106 and 121, please go to the double doors on the wall opposite of this desk. There, your guide will begin your tour. Jamie and Claudia went. Their guide was an Indian girl who wore a sari and whose long hair was bound into a single braid that hung down her back to well below her waist. With one hand, she lifted the folds of her sari. Her walk was favored by her costume. Her steps were short and light, and there appeared to be great movement around her knees. Claudia looked down at her guide's skin and thought of the smoky to topaz, no November, her mother's birthstone. She listened to her guide's accent and formed the sounds in her mind without listening to what the sounds she said. Thus, when the tour was finished, Claudia was no expert of the United Nations, but she had discovered something different. Saris are a way of being different. She could do two things, she decided. When she was grown, she could stay the way she was and move to some place like India, where no one dressed as she did, or she could dress like someone else, the Indian guide even, still live in an ordinary place like Greenwich. We're going to pause here for a second. Hey guys, so we're going to finish where we left off. We just have a little bit more of chapter 8. I can't think of any right now, he thought for a minute and said, I haven't 
I haven't been a tightwad all my life, have I? As long as I've known you, Claudia answered. Well, you've known me all... You've known me for as long as I've known me, he said, smiling. Yes, Claudia said. I've been the oldest child since before you were born. They enjoyed the train ride. A large portion of it went over the track they had never been, they had never been before. Claudia arrived in Hartford feeling much happier than she had since they received the morning's mail. Her self-assurance had returned to her. The Hartford station was on Farmington Avenue. Claudia reasoned that they could not be far from Farmington itself. Why take a bus and worry about which stop to get off? Without consulting, Jamie hailed a cab. When it stopped, she got in. Jamie followed. Claudia told the driver to take them to the house of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler in Farmington, Connecticut. Claudia sat back in the taxi at last. In that, Saxonburg, is how I enter the story. Claudia and Jamie Kincaid came to see me about Angel. And that is it for Chapter 8. We'll pick up on Chapter 9 in a little bit.